did you have a, a specific starting point in mind, Luke? Man. All right. Uh, well, my thought was, <laughs> why don't we uh, – see, I'm prepared for this. Uh, yeah. Why don't we kind of start uh, with kind of the, the, the basic principles that you're working from, you know, the, 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 the philosophy and what the objectives are. Okay. Shoot, go for it now. Go, go All right, good. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the, the like the biggest thing in for, for all strength coaches is that we have to make sure that we keep our athletes healthy, and especially in season, how do we keep them healthy? And in preseason and lead up to preseason is how do we best prepare them for the upcoming um, rigorous schedule of of competing. And uh, I think this is the, the biggest thing. And, uh, you know, the, the idea that increasing performance uh, in season it, it is very difficult. Uh, I think that perform increasing performance comes in small doses in season, but the, you know, the big, the big gains will be made in the summer. So uh, by the time athletes show up to preseason, it's um, a little bit different. Uh, mindset and the way we we tackle the strength and conditioning. Okay. Um, do you want to start at a specific point? You know, we could we could probably walk through a season cycle. Um, how do you think of it in terms of of a calendar? Do you start at the beginning of the season or do you start at the beginning of summer? Uh, no, I usually I usually let the guys have their summer. Okay. Um. And then I'll start to talk to them probably about one month out from preseason. Gotcha. And then from that one month is kind of like a lead up program. And that lead up program usually, um, it'll prime them for the way that I plan to work through preseason. So I want to try and minimize any sort of um, shock to the system. So if they can start, in their own time and gradually work it there in, into the program the way that will work. Uh, there's going to be a less of a shock to the system when it comes to the weights programs um, because regardless, they're going to have some sort of a shock when they start to play volleyball again. Sure. Uh, just a, a real quick side for the, for the audience. This is an open conversation for those who haven't been on one of these before. So feel free to shoot in questions. Anytime you like, if uh, we're talking about something that you want to get more info on, go ahead. The, the easiest way to do it is to use the, the question and answer function. Uh, that way we, we'll see the questions immediately. Sometimes they can get lost in the chat if, if it starts getting active. So, all right, got that out of the way. Um, so you, you, what sort of things do you, you, got, you, have, do you have these guys doing in that month out before you actually get them uh, so I'll probably, I'll get them to, I won't have them jumping, um, uh, that's for sure. Cause a lot of the guys are just, if they're jumping, they're usually doing it through, through beach volleyball. Uh, and usually the, the discussion and I'm sure Mark can comment on this, that the jumping portion usually falls more into the, how the, the coach wants to integrate getting the guys back to jumping. Uh, so most of the time I'm getting them to work, like I said, the way that I want. And personally, I prefer like, uh, I, I prefer guys to work globally. So full body workouts and probably getting them to start three, minimum three times a week. Um, and then, then having them transition into the start of season. Usually with preseason, it's going to be three. Uh, sessions a week, uh, if not more. But if it is more, then those extra sessions are going to be more based around prevention uh, through body weight, uses of uh, therabands and and stuff like this. But uh, yeah, that first, that leading program, again, is just like getting them used to how I want to work and, you know, full body workouts and then uh, getting that to lead into the start of the season. Okay. Okay. Um you know, you brought up the idea of jump counts, and actually, we had a question come in about that. So, I mean, in Mark, you can jump in on this. Uh, Mark, I know you do a lot of one v one, two v two type stuff early in preseason, as you know, get them touching the ball, get some conditioning going. 
when do you get them actively jumping? What's the progression? That is my conditioning training. Okay. Go on. Sorry, I didn't even catch the last part. Yeah, <laughs> you're hearing that. Is that on your end? Is that, is that a bird yeah, or what? Okay. That's over. I don't know. Okay. Maybe. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just um, asking the question of uh, when do you get the guys? How do you how do you handle jump load through the the preseason? Uh, the way that I normally do it is that the first um, so work around. It. And actually, the last time I did this, did this for real was three years ago. But the basic idea is that it's an eight-week preparation. The uh, the first week will be probably no jumping on the first three days. Um, Thursday might be some uh, maybe the maybe the small games will jump on Wednesday, Thursday. And maybe on Friday there will be some spiking, spiking, and then a little bit more building up in the second week, so that probably don't do any six against six, or depending on how many players you have in the team, anything resembling six against six until the end of the second week is the is the dream scenario. Uh, not uh, well, the dream scenario is that everybody arrives ready to play volleyball on the first day, but that, that doesn't happen. That's why it's a dream. Yeah, right. um, but you, you normally, you, you have to sort of pay attention as you go along and see how the guys cope with the, the work from day to day. And, um, and then um, you can, you can go faster, but you can, you can always start slow and go faster, but you can never go too hard and get anything back. So if you once you've overtrained them, then they're overtrained for the whole season. So mm -hmm. that was actually the first lesson I learned. Yeah. Do you, Luckily, do you, I wasn't a coach of that team. <laughs> do you consider jump counts in any formal fashion or have a sense of them as you're doing your progression? Either of you guys can in the preseason. Yeah, you know, I I I have never I have never counted jumps in the preseason. Um, Luke, I think that if you the if you plan the way that you plan it, if you plan it correctly, that you can you can you can pretty much predict how many jumps someone's going to be doing. Uh, I don't think you really need to have like a vert max on and. You know, okay, this person did 100 jumps today. You know, I, I think if, through planning you can you can understand how many jumps, you know, or how, what the load of that jump's going to be because it's very different to doing like, you know, the small jumps in the mini games compared to if you're going and doing like a, a max a max spike jump, you know, because, uh, you know, you can you can start to, to work and like the same, you know, you can, you can do a beach volleyball session and the load... On the, on the joints is going to be a lot less, but the muscles are going to work harder. So I think it's that if you plan correctly, then you don't, you don't need to be sitting there counting how many jumps, you know? Okay, if, if you have the technology, sure, use it. But I think it comes down to more the way that the, you, you plan it. All right, just uh, for those who may not be aware, tomorrow's we have a session with one of the guys from Vert, one of their analytics guys. Uh, along with a coach that will get into some of the numbers type stuff. So that, uh, you might find that interesting. Um, okay. You, you know, Luke, you talked to, about doing, you know, at least three days of, of work during preseason, obviously on, uh, in turn, uh, on top of the volleyball stuff. Mm -hmm. um, can you guys talk about the, the load balance between being in the weight room and related activities and being in the gym? working with balls, how many sessions a day, you know, you, you're, you're doing of each, and you know, about times. I think it's, uh, it, it depends on the coach and it depends how the coach really wants to tackle the, the preseason and then the same season. 
Uh, you know, some coaches like to, to split the session. So some guys will start in the weight room in the morning and then transition to the court um, or vice versa. You know, maybe the passers will start on the court and then come into the weight room. Um, or some coaches might say, okay, this morning's just for weights and, and then tonight we'll, we'll do uh, just the court. So it just depends how, how the coach really wants, how the coach wants to progress that session. Um, but I think it's important that the communication between the coach and also, you know, strength, strength and conditioning and physios uh, with, with how that's going to work because um, you don't want to plan a session in the morning that's really heavy and really hard and then, then you're surprised by that the coach in the evening is all of a sudden crushing him with, you know, a lot of jumps or something. So I think you kind of have to be able to, to work together in, in, in monitoring and, and handling the load of what the players is going to get. And I think that this is important and not just at our level because this is also important um, at the junior level because, you know, a lot of, a lot of places players aren't just playing for one team and a lot of the time the communication between different coaches is never happening. So, you know, one kid might jump 200 times the night before and then they show up to a different practice the next day and then doing it again and again and again. So I think the relationship between the, the coach and the, and the rest of the staff is really important in regards to that stuff. Yeah, I, I th Luke's made a, was a little bit too, well, he said kind of, sort of, about the communication between the, the physical coach and the head coach um he's sort of understating it a fair, fair bit there <laughs> the, the the head coach and the physical coach have to be on the same page always but especially in that especially in that time period um the way that i structure my pre-season is that uh with the eight i have an eight week program and for four, the first four weeks, the, and Luke can correct me if my practice is not the same as my, my words, but the first four weeks, the, uh, the emphasis is on weight training and the program is, uh, is one of three days a week weight training and two days a week prevention, which is a, a different focus of, uh, it's still, weight work but a, a different focus um, and that goes on for four weeks and basically the conversation I have with the physical coach in that time is that they have the priority and uh, they uh, they run the program under those conditions as they as they want and I will make adjustments in the evenings in the afternoons um, to make sure that they just get through the week so the the goal is that they um they just get through to the end of the week but probably wouldn't be able to practice on uh, on well not well anyway on saturday and those f first four weeks so the the program is also that the weekends are free so uh, um so i always have the basic basic principle there in place is four weeks four weeks emphasis on weight training five days a week um, doing physical work and then two days uh, weekend free to do what you have to do to come back again on Monday. And I'll just expand on what Mark's saying because I can talk about when we worked here in Yoshemia together. That um, so just to to kind of expand on Mark's. Uh, structure there with the five days was that we were doing weights Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the mornings, uh, which were, like I said, global sessions, uh, which in the first four weeks, everyone was doing the same. Uh, and because obviously uh, I also needed to start to learn about the, um, the athletes and what their bodies required. So we did that. And then on the Tuesday, Thursday, um, in the beginning, we started with just a general circuit with all, 
all prevention exercises and everyone did the circuit together. And then once we got past that period, when we were starting to a little bit more prevention on the other stuff, and probably even towards the end of week three and four, was that guys were categorized. So we had a group that guys uh, that focused on their shoulders and health of their shoulders. And then we had a group of guys that were focused on knees and then anything else we, we, we adjusted for. Some guys did a bit of both. So we started to specialize a little bit more on what each athlete needed. And then moving into season, we started to, to give guys individual programs. All right. Uh, uh, that brings and up a question that I was going to ask. Uh, just to, hang on. <laughs> just to um, e expand on Luke's expansion, once we started to once we start to do the individual programming, that's done uh, in consultation in cooperation with the, the physio as well. Mm -hmm. So the, at, while that's going on, the physios are doing their initial consultations they're doing um some little testing uh of their own and then between the physical coach and the this is the ideal version um the physical coach and the, the physio working together and producing the programs um those individual prevention programs and on on that that's i can uh, unless you want to ask the question john well no the question is is related which is why i wanted to bring it up here yeah uh, you know looking at things like imbalances mm -hmm. and how uh coaching staff especially in a situation where maybe they don't have a physio who can guide them mm -hmm. can help evaluate potential imbalances and then you know what you can do to kind of structure workouts to to get the athletes to address you know, in, in kind of also in a performance mode, but also largely in a preventative sort of program to, to, to avoid potential injury risk. Like how would you do it? Yeah, just, just some, you know, if, if you didn't have access to a physio to, to do these things for you, to, to provide you with information, you know, on mm -hmm. an athlete, what could you do in your own right to test an athlete out, to look at where, okay, maybe – we need to do more hamstring work for this particular player, for example. Yeah, yeah. I think if you, if like, if you haven't got a physio, you're probably going to be looking more at the, I guess, lower levels in professional, but also juniors. And I think if you're addressing juniors, that you're really going to have to be, you have to put the net pretty wide. I think you have to make sure you take care of all areas because you want to, you know, kids, okay, volleyball is never good for your body. But when you're becoming, when you're a kid, um, you, you need to start to prepare them for, you know, certain, certain aspects. So I think if you're looking at someone, you can look at how, they, how much body control have they got, you know, because body control and, and the way that you, when you move is, is a bigger deal and the way that, you know, you, are you efficient in your movements? You know, are your muscles supporting the joints they where they need to? Are, you know, is your knee tracking correctly? These things, a lot of the time you can see is just like, you know, you can, you can look up certain exercises to see how someone moves. Like, you know, is, you know, to even be able to say, are they prepared to, to start to do weights? And look, there's people that are at the highest professional level that have certain techniques and problems that you can attribute to the fact that they probably started lifting before they should have because they didn't have, you know, control of a certain joint down, you know? So I think that when you're looking at juniors, you have to say, all right, look, I'm just going to give them everything. You know, we're going to do a lot of, you know, control from the ankles and then just work our way up, you know, ankles, knees, core stability and shoulder, you know, and, and, and through that, just try and get uh, an overall better health of the athlete and try to get them to work on those kind of muscles. Okay. The, the reason I bring it up is because of things like ACL problems in women's volleyball. And, mm -hmm. you know, Hillary could probably attest to having teammates that, that have that. Uh, and, it's, and it's a risk that doesn't necessarily show up when you just watch the athlete. Like you wouldn't just – there. 
there are certain maybe body types that you could look at and go, all right, maybe there's more risk there than, than otherwise. But I've seen athletes where you wouldn't look at them and go, okay, you're a high risk, but then they still blow their knee out in okay. some innocuous way. And it could be because right, maybe they should have done more work here or less work there or whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah, I um, think they did a study recently on, on ACLs, especially in volleyball. But I think that the, the study was actually across, they did it with athletes that were, you know, at a high level, but then they also started to work on athletes. They looked at athletes that were currently pregnant and then athletes after pregnancy. So it was like this really big study. It was, it was out there. I didn't read the whole thing. That's, that's beyond what I was interested in, but I know that they did do some sort of study. Okay. Um, all right. So we're talking about preseason. You've, you've talked about that first, you know, first, first four week mark where the, the focus is on the weight training side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the second four weeks looking like? Um, just to complete that, uh, that thought, the idea behind the prevention, uh, the extra prevention work uh, is uh, was actually when I started doing that with uh, with a doctor at, at a particular club that I was at, and in the years that I've used that format in in uh, uh, in the preseason, the the number of injuries over the course of the season is is fairly drastically reduced. So um, the whether it might just be coincidence, it might be a combination of a whole bunch of things, but I have really good positive experience with that kind of work in reducing injuries, which is the uh, or minimizing injuries, which is the number one the number one focus. Um, as as Luke mentioned from the beginning, is uh, is for the players to be healthy. So the that's the that's that first four week period. The right. second uh, wait, four wait, 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 hold on, Mark. Before, before you progress, um, since we've, we've talked about this, you, you brought it up, so we might as well address it now. What does that program look like? What does that prevention program look like? Oh, I don't know. I tell the physical coach to do it. Luke. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, can, I can talk about that. Um, so... So it, it like, I, like I said, it, it depends on <laughs> it depends it depends on the coach. Um, so when I was with Mark, we did the 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 circuits, and then as it worked into season, a lot of athletes still had it involved. Um, then and uh, what else? Then. Uh, you can have it set up so you can have it included in their weights program, like on the three days. Um, then you can have, you know, you can have it incorporated into your warm up, like a lot of, uh, you can do it in your evening or your morning ones. Um, yeah, so I think it just depends, like, like the way Mark's saying it, it depends. So like for us this year, because we were only doing three weight sessions um, a day, oh, sorry, not a day, but we were doing three sessions a week. Yeah, three a day would be a lot, but uh, three a week. That um, that I was including the prevention in the weights programs. So they had the the weights that they were doing, with, you know, with uh, some Olympic lifts, uh, some accessories. But they also had their uh, their prevention inside those three days, so that I knew that we were doing it. And then the off days, I was running it in the warm ups. So I was doing a lot of body weight stuff. Um, and on those off days, we were doing, uh, which is something we can also talk about, is, is we did barefoot uh, training, uh, warm-ups. So in the, in the morning sessions we did, uh, the guys would come in with no shoes on and we would start to work on like some proprioception uh, and also you know, strengthening the, the muscles of the feet and ankle, which you know, obviously is... It, good for for all the athletes Um, and then doing a lot of different balance exercises um, to help with the knees and the hips. Um, So I felt, I felt that this was, was really good as well. And it was something fun that, you know, the athletes hadn't, hadn't done before. Okay. 
Very good. Uh, Mark, we had a question from Duarte. I was wondering if you think the, the results of your prevention program inclusion was because you somehow reduced the, the daily or weekly load. Um, I, I don't know what reduced that means in that context because the weight training load actually is increased because I was doing five, I'm doing five sessions instead of three. And even if they're written in a different way, um, the players still, if they're done pretty well, the players still come out of there with fatigue. And um, so the weight training load is not reduced you're still doing the same on the other three days as well. Um, the, uh, I, I don't ever jump in the mornings, so they're not replacing a jumping program, a jumping, um, my morning jumping session. Um, what, I, what I said and what I, I suspect is that it, part of it's a combination or that, it, I mean, everything is a combination and I don't tend to have long sessions and, I'm sorry, I do not have long training sessions and I don't push guys to, um, to be exhausted. Um, and I'm sure that that plays a role in it as well. So the fatigue is a, is a really big cause of injury. So, um, you know, the, we're, the guys are always tired, but I never, I never have guys that are really hanging on the edge and can barely get through a week and, that kind of thing so for sure that is a part of it as well as the prevention program um, just so people know you you basically never go beyond two hours for your sessions do you really not unless these warm-ups for me go an extra half hour yeah not unless luke does a warm-up <laughs> okay um all right we've got we've got a couple of questions here that we could probably hit on right now uh, uh, from Giannis, how do you tackle the difference between players um, in terms of the difference in workloads? For example, some are coming from national teams with a tough summer. Others won't have been playing over the summer, uh, et cetera. So we had this this year. Um, we actually had a really crazy preseason because we had, like, like you said, the guys coming from um, – the guys coming from doing nothing. Um, so, you know, getting them in from the start, you can go, you know, if they've done the lead in program, you can't, you have to hope that they've done it. Um, obviously you, like Mark, one of Mark's rules is you can't trust that they've done it unless you see it with your own eyes. But, um, you, you know, you can go, you can work pretty hard with the guys, those guys when they're coming in uh, because they've had a, a long rest, but in, in saying that, you also have to, that they're the guys that you have to be extra careful with because they've had that period um, where they haven't been doing so much. So you have to find that that balance of uh, how much to push, um, especially when it comes to, to court and, and starting to jump again. And then we had those guys, then we had guys that were coming from uh, European Championships, <clears throat> which was, you know, there was really heavy heavy schedule so you know even if they got three days off we had to bring them back and then it was more about kind of easing them back into it because a lot of the guys in the european championships weren't getting a regular chance to lift so when they come back for me it's it's really important to to, to find out what they've been doing when was the last time they did it and then start to, to integrate them into the program you know because Again, we're trying to minimise that shock to the system. Um, the volleyball part for them was going to be easy because they've been playing a lot. Uh, but the guys that have been doing, you know, maybe lighter weights from being in the tournament, maybe they're coming off VNL. You know, you have to really, again, it's, it's again, it gets, comes down to communication. You have to talk to them, and you have to find out what they've been doing, and and then work work from there. Okay. Um, a question from uh, Solange. Do you guys work with sports nutritionists at the club or with the national team? Uh, and how do you work together if you do? No. <laughs> okay. 
we do, we we do not. No, I haven't worked with them. So. Yeah, we don't we don't is have that, one. Either. Okay, was well, that be is that by choice or or by force of situation? For, for us, I, I think if we wanted to get a nutritionist, we could. Um, but, uh, you know, and I did a questionnaire at the start of how guys, um, it was an open questionnaire of like supplements and uh, the, how they felt about their nutrition goals and stuff like that. Um, and for the most part, the guys and knowing how the guys were, they were pretty good with nutrition. Um, and I... Personally, I don't want to be the guy that's that's on them about um, like we do testing for we, like we do the body fat testing, skin folds, all this stuff. And if a guy is really having problems, I'll sit down. If a guy really wants to say, okay, how can I make my nutrition better, then then we can talk. But we don't have someone coming in and saying, all right, you need to to eat X, Y, and Z. Um, and for the most part, the guys that that we're working with are like 30 to 33, you know, been playing professionally for 15 years. So most of them are pretty good with, with knowing their body. So uh, that's why we, we don't have one here. Gotcha. Uh, just checking to see if there's anything else. Um, we got another question from Duarte, whether there's any tools that you use to monitor uh, load or anything along those lines. You mentioned the vert. Should we talk about RPE on this one, Mark? Yep. Go for it. Right. So uh, this is uh, this is something that we use in the national team and actually something that uh, I believe Anastasi was using in Warsaw this year. Uh, but we have a program set up through the, the national centre back home or the, the association that players at the end of every session or at the end of the day, fill in um, their RPE. So it's their the rate of exertion. So just wait to, for, for clarification, RPE is rate of exertion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's so, not an objective measure, it's the player's subjective feeling about yes, their exactly. workload for the day. Yeah, and it's, and it's all individual. You know, it's not because what... So it's rated from zero to 10, 10 being you should be in hospital. Um, is you know different for everybody. So um, at the end of the sessions, the guys would would put down what they had, um, and you know, you know, if a session was like a five or a six, you know, for one guy maybe that was you know, and that was a maybe a middle had a day where it was really tough. So Mark had made the the training plan for that. The middles were going to get a lot of reps and it was going to be really hard. So they might rate it higher, whereas maybe, you know, like a Libro or someone that hasn't hit as many balls or been as active might rate it a little lower. So we were using that a lot to just to gauge on how to, to use it in the way of training planning, which I'll let Mark talk more about. Um, but the program also allows the players to put down like their, their sleep quality, um, how they're general wellness is um, different, like different things like this, just to get the overall picture. And then the physios would process the information, send it out to us and they could also keep track to, to see how it was. So I think this was a pretty handy um, program to have. Uh, for me, I was always trying to put the weights program around a three or four. Um, so I was kind of, always, I had a goal in mind. So I could always see what I wanted the, the players to be at in regards to weights. Um, and then we could also start to track how other certain individuals were feeling, uh, especially when we're on the road. Okay. Mark? The, the, this system with the national team worked really well. I, uh, I really liked the, the way that it worked. You need to, you need to do it for a little bit to understand the players uh, because players actually have individual ways of rating things because the, uh, the, the RP, the rate of perceived exertion uh, has, I think when they study it, is, is very consistent within an individual. 
Uh, and so we had a player in the national team, for example, who was uh, every, if we did a stretching session in a hotel corridor, it would be a seven. Uh, and a normal practice, a normal practice was a nine. So the first time he came up with a seven for what everybody else had as threes was what the hell is that all about? What's, what's up with him? Turned out that's just how he filled it in or how he thought about it or whatever. So we, we knew that, uh, it came up red on the report, but wasn't actually red. So that part of it is uh, uh, is individual. But one other uh, from a uh, from a coach's perspective is is you have to over time, or you have to pay attention to uh, to players' responses to different things. Uh, you have to uh, learn what players' personalities are like, um, and then once you have a, a, some um, implicit knowledge of the individuals and the group, then you can start to see things. You can start to see things. So how players walk into the gym is, uh, is an indication of, uh, of what their current level of, of uh, fatigue or stress is, how they interact with each other, um, how, you know, I make jokes about this, but, uh, if players cut their hair or not, if they go a long time without cutting their hair, if they shave or don't shave, um, these are, uh, are actually little indications or they don't have to be, but they, they often are. And if you pay attention to them, you can get a, um, a, also a good feeling for how the players are responding to whatever the training and competition uh, import stress is. Uh <clears throat> I was chatting with Alex Porter um, at the University of Essex about this, and he's he's been trying to use it there. He brought up a couple of concerns just in terms of data collection, primarily. Uh, mm -hmm. One of his issues was when do you actually have them fill out their RPE? So how long after the, the workout or the end of the day or, or whenever you're taking it? In the evenings, the guys usually fill them out at dinner so on the, or on the bus on the way home. So it was pretty, pretty soon after. It wasn't like, you know, filling out the next day. Um, you know, it was, if not, like if we were getting on the bus, that's probably 30 minutes after a session. Um, if dinner is, you know, not too long after that. So the evening sessions were, were usually pretty, pretty responsive straight after. Okay. Yeah, because Alex was uh, making not, a comment that it was, you get a different RP, a significantly different RP if you ask like five minutes after a workout than if you, like you said, if it was 30 minutes or an hour or something like that. Yeah, for sure. So you were going to say uh, something, Mark? Not, yeah, if it's not clear, the, the, what we're talking about, the system that we're talking about, uh, it works through an app. So the players have it all installed on their phones. Uh, or they can have, and the, the physio also has a, a tablet with that um, uh, with the app installed that the players can uh, also do their put in uh, import their information from the from the, the physio's uh, the physio's tablet. So that's the the format for collecting the data. And there was you know, a question about if it was for each session or for the day, and for each session. So. Okay. The morning session gets up here tonight and gets as well. All right. Do you know the name of the system? <clears throat> I don't know. No, I don't know what they, they've set it up. So it's a, a big one. AMS. Yeah, AMS, yeah. Athlete measuring. It's, a, it's not a, a commercially available one. It's one developed specifically for the Australian Institute of Sport. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they also have to do their RPA on days off as well. So this keeps the data, the, you know, the graphs correct. Sure. Uh, Mark, related to your observations about shaving, not shaving, what guys look like coming in, just that sort of stuff. I remember a few years ago, I think one of the Italian football clubs was doing video of the players as they were arriving to training, something along those lines. To, to look at how they walked in, basically how they came in the door as some way of judging their level of fatigue 
coming into training? Is that ringing any bells? Uh, I've heard odd stories of uh, things that football teams did. Um, there's one one story that when they maybe I want to say it's Arsenal, but it could be anybody really that they when the players came into the training center at the, at the more in the morning, they did a heart rate, blood pressure, and and maybe even a blood test, like a prick a prick test, and the, based on the results that they had. That, that that was the determinant of the training program they had that day. Um, and that's obviously a, some kind of dream scenario. Uh, some NBA teams are, are actually uh, do, are using the, the sleep recording apps um, that to, to, monitor, to monitor the guys because sleep is a, is a really big factor. The basic, and I was, I was going to mention this at some point, but the one of the when we talk about monitoring athletes and in whatever way that is, if it's testing, sort of physical testing, all of these things are resources that uh, volleyball clubs tend to have limits on, um, and it's the it's the uh, they're great ideas and they're wonderful um, principles to have, but in practice, they you can you can get bogged down in them, especially as a head coach, um, and they're not very useful if they, they take you away from your core business, which is uh, which is sort of coaching the team and pre- and preparing the. Uh, preparing practice and preparing for the next game. So um, they're, they're really good and useful and wonderful, but you have to be aware of them a little bit because you can go down a, a rabbit hole. That's why yeah, it's and good. I think that was one of the points Alex was making was managing the RPE collection and evaluation was becoming a, a, a significant trouble spot for him because he was basically working by himself. He doesn't have an assistant coach. He gets some support, so it was just too much load for for the for him as the coaching staff. I, I started my first kind of first opportunity to run a program, for want of a better description, was at the AIS, the Australian Institute of Sport, and I had a whole sports science division at my disposal for running tests and blah, blah, whatever, whatever I wanted to do, biomechanics, physiology and nutrition. And I learned really quickly that, that they would, they do the tests, but for, to, to actually make it useful and practical, it's your work. So, and I had, I was me and I just didn't have enough hours in the day to go through the biomechanics data and the physiology data and the RPEs and, actually remember even to go to practice in the afternoon. So, you know, it's a, um, if you have the resources, it's really fantastic. And to have a guy like Luke was a, is, is the dream scenario. And I got to live the dream. Oh, touch. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So RPE is subjective. Uh, are there any objective measures that you, that you guys use, Luke? Like, you know, we talked about vert as, as one possibility. Is anything else along those lines? Uh, the, for me, I don't use many tests. This may sound bad. It's probably something that I need to improve. Um, we do, like, body weight, uh, you know, skin folds, percentage and like this, and this is more to keep the guys on track and, and, and something to go towards um, and also recording their own weights. But in regards to like testing, like I don't do max testing, which a lot of places will do. Um, like, you know, come in to start a season and even I had this as an athlete that you come in, you do your one square, uh, one squat max, you do your bench, you know, and you try and get these maximums. But um, this isn't personally how I work um, because I think that, there is more risk in trying to push someone to do a maximum effort any time of season. It doesn't matter when. Um, 
that you know if you're trying to push to one rep the guy is more likely or girl is more likely to hurt themselves um than than really get the benefits of of getting the, that that data so for me the way that that i prefer to work is that um the athletes are the ones that are the ones that can pick what weight they they want to lift um, because everyone again is different. It comes down to individual, you know, one guy might not be playing so much. So he pushes harder in the gym. One guy may have played two games in a week. So he's taken a little bit lighter. Um, so kind of not doing though that testing format leads kind of into the way that I like to work. But I think there's other things that I could probably get better at doing. So this is something that I need to personally grow as a, as a coach. Okay, um, just because we haven't really touched on it yet, and I, I promise we will eventually get to what Mark does in the second half of preseason. I did just notice the time. I think this one might go for a while. <laughs> What's uh, look? What are the the, the main um, type of exercises you do with the the weight training? It's pretty broad um, because by the time we get out of pre-season, um, every player I give an individual program to. So like Mark touched on uh, before, uh, so we'll do a, a program together at the start. So, uh, you know, it'll have like, you know, obviously squats. What kind of squat will depend on the athlete. So... Uh, it could be a back squat. Some guys might prefer to front squat. Uh, the, this year, I, we purchased a belt squat machine, uh, which means that you'd have no pressure on your lumbar spine, which is a big thing to try and avoid. Um, and then you can have your Olympic lifts, so cleans for sure. Um, if, if not, then the, we have the guys doing some high pulls, so they didn't have to worry so much more about the catch technique. Um, split squats, for sure in there. Pullovers, uh, a lot of back. Yeah, I, I try and touch on, on and everything just to really give the guys a, a good overall basis of strength. And then obviously the, the small prevention, uh, well, small, a lot of prevention uh, on the smaller muscles to, to, to really help them. Uh, stay on the court um, but you know when we go into season like I said uh, guys will have individual programs I'll write the program then this year I sat down with the two physios we went through everyone's program they gave me their opinions on what guys should or shouldn't be doing and maybe it was just one or two tweaks to an exercise then once I sat down with them and had done it I then went and sat down with the athlete. I went over it with the athlete and I said, does this look good to you? Is there anything you would like to personally change? Because when you get to the higher levels, that there are athletes that have done things a certain way for so long and they felt successful this way. So if a guy didn't like an exercise because he told me, oh, my hips feel weird after this exercise, then we changed it for something else that he would prefer and that still achieved the same goal. So, you know, there's, there's a big, like I said, there's a really big range of exercises once you start to break it down into 14 athletes programs. Sure. Um, all right. And I, Just, yeah, I'd, like to, I'd like to add, uh, add something to that. And the, there are two really important things that Luke, that Luke said there was. One was the, and I already said this once, but I probably can't say it enough, is the coordination between the, the physical coach and the, um, and the physios. If you have physios, if you have doctors, then they are a part of the, they have to be a part of the process. And the working relationship between uh, the physio and the physical coach is in some ways even more important than the working relationship between the physical coach and the head coach. And, they, uh, you can, I'll, let me tell you, I'll give you an example. Imagine there's a professional club and there's a player who has a, a herniated disc in his back and the physical coach gives him deadlifts to do. 
So just imagine, imagine that, and then imagine that the player <laughs> gets the player hurts his back and he's out for five weeks. So that is not something that really ought to happen in the in the real world. So that communication is really important. The second thing that Luke touched on, but I I I think is more important, or I think it's worth stressing is the the point about changing the exercises so my experience a lot of physical coaches have their have their program have their exercises that they want to do they like to do and if for whatever reason the the player is not able to do one exercise then the the basic somebody has knee pain okay can't do squats then the, the response is really often to just not do that exercise. And that's no, that's not the, a good response because you still need to be strong. You still need to you know, be improving and, um, and fixing, the, fixing the injury. So one really, really key point is that coordination between all the parties to change the exercises as you go through because the um, there's always a way to uh, to work to work without pain in whatever the area is, and that's the really big thing that I I learned from Luke, and that uh, was a, is a really important part of his programs that I don't think should be um, should be understated at all is the ability to change the program from day to day within the range of the athletes daily capabilities while keeping moving forward with the uh, the the overall goal mm -hmm. absolutely okay uh we had a quick question on whether you use cmj as a fatigue monitoring tool no i don't yeah, it can be for sure like i said this is something i need to get better at um, again, it's, you know, it's, it's, if you want to personally use it and if you want to use it in your club and like they did some, some counter stuff with the national team this last summer to test, but they were doing it across a, a long, a long period and from different levels. Uh, but in the club, no, I don't, I don't personally use it. Um, Again, I'm I'm more trying to be talking to players and, and physios each day and, and just watching watching the guys, not so much on the the, the data analysis side. Um, which, again, like I said, I personally need to get better at, but um, just a different way to how I work. Okay, um, Miguel wants to know. <clears throat> he talked about not doing max testing. Uh, he is wondering if you've ever done max testing by speed instead of weight uh, again you can you can have like the little devices that you put on the, the barbell for for your your cleans and speed like that um, but no I personally haven't done the the speed aspect of, of the testing again I, I, I like I said I think for the guys to come into the gym one I want them to when they come into the gym it's somewhere they enjoy that that when they come in it that they personally know they're going to develop and grow and, and they're going to enjoy the the, the session um, and two that they have some guidance over on, on what it is there was only very few times this year that i really told guys and this is once they knew what weights they were already lifting that it was a deload week that they were going to lift you know 60 70 50 sometimes percent of what they had already been lifting and these guys were recording their weights um, themselves so that I knew that, you know, they had control. They could look at the number, right? It's a deload week. I can go back a little bit less. Um, but like I said, no, I'm, I'm personally not, not doing a lot of the testing in regards to them saying doing, you know, okay, it's an 80% of your one rep max this week or, you know, all speed. So okay. it's a little, a little bit different. Right. Um... 
Okay, Miguel wants, was asking to an extension on that, uh, if you did it not just for testing, but also for monitoring. Uh, but it sounds like that's a no. You're not, you're not using this, the speed evaluation on a consistent basis, so, all right. Okay, so done with that. Um, Santiago wanted to know if you monitor your strength training during the season based on drop jumps performance and their RSI reactive strength index. I'm Sorry, guessing that's a no. Do you monitor your strength training during the season based on drop jumps performance and their RSI or reactive strength index? No. <laughs> like I said, that I'm, not a, I'm not a big data guy. <laughs> All right. You're leaving a lot of disappointed people in the crowd here. I am apologizing. <laughs> I know like, this is terrible. The strength coach should be behind his laptop looking at all these numbers, but uh, yeah, this is, it, and maybe, maybe it's just completely different to a lot of other, the way that other people work. Um, but like I said, I'm, the data side of things, the, the biggest data for me is I have, and Mark, please, I have 14 players. If I have 14 players playing in the game and they can play at maximum, I've done my job for that week. If I have 14 the next week, I've done my job. If I have one guy that's less, how can I get that one guy to be back on the court? You know, so the number for me is 14 and this is the biggest data number. And I want to always make sure that that number is at, at its best. Okay. Uh, another question from Solange. Uh, so you, you mentioned using this, the skin fold. At what interval do you think athletes should be taken into account? Um, so how often are you doing the testing? Uh, and do you differentiate between the positions where you take them? So the way we have the physios take them, I'm not personally taking skin folds. The, the physios are using that one. And we do it every two weeks where we can. Um, there was a period this month because of the crazy schedule that we didn't do one for a month. Um, but we're trying to do it every two weeks. Um, and again, I think... The, the, like, hey, it's, I, I do it to see how the progression is, especially from pre-season because um, you can have athletes coming in in a shape, but it's the round variety um, and trying to get them back to playing shape as fast as possible. But then as you find that once you start to get a few numbers that it actually becomes more interesting for the players. And the players are the ones that are trying to check, oh, did I go down in this category? Did I go down in this position? You know, they can weigh themselves, but they're not really getting the measurements at home. So it, was, it's in, it becomes more interesting and more of a challenge for the players to try and push themselves in this department. What about the difference between the skin fold and, and BMI? BMI can be completely crazy because if you put your number in and... Like, okay, for me, because I'm shorter, but I'm, I'm a bigger guy, then my BMI will say, oh, you're over. Okay, well, I'm a heavy guy anyway. But they'll say you're morbidly obese. So it can, it can sometimes get lost because it doesn't really judge too much on exact uh, specifics. Okay, I, let me clarify. Those. Okay, BMI would, would be general. What about uh, body fat index? Like the percentage? Yeah. Well, we, we, we track that as well. So like after the skin folds, they put it through the data and then we get the, gotcha. the percentages. So, um, but again, like, you know, we have guys that are really, really lean that will be like, you know, a really low number, say 6%. And then I might have, and I've had this, the two times I've, I've worked in the Shambia, one was a middle blocker and this year was a Libro. But because they had, like they were skinny guys, but they had really elastic skin. So a lot of the times, you know, it didn't matter what, what they did was because they were getting a big reading because the elasticity in their skin was sometimes, you know, crazy. But you look at the guy and you say, he's in great shape. So, you know, you sometimes have to be like, all right, he's at 11%, but he, he's probably not an 11% because of these readings. Okay. All right. A uh, question that I want to get to before we move on. We talked a little bit about rest and recovery, uh, in particular in terms of 
having weekends off uh, in that first four weeks and also getting sleep. Uh, do you set any, uh, you know, minimums about in terms of amount of time between sessions? Um, wide sessions or session sessions? All of the above. I mean, weight sessions, are obviously, you're not doing them uh, multiple times a day. So, but say between weights and ball training or between ball training. Um, it's Did you, no, you didn't hear me? I always have the weight sessions. I'm not keep track of. Am I back again? Yep. Can you yeah, hear yeah. me again? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I... I always I don't keep track of is not exactly the right word, but I'm I'm conscious of the time between sessions. So you know if if there's more or less than 24 hours between a between a court session, um, you know I'll I'll bow to the physical coach about the the timing between the weight sessions. So you know, again, that's obviously you don't want to be have two sessions in 24 hours. Am I right, Luke? You can, but you have to plan it pretty good. No, you don't. You see, you don't want to. So, yeah. so yeah. I I pay. I'm conscious of it. I don't sit there and write down the the times in between. But I I I'm conscious of the the differences of the times, especially if it's different from normal. So, one of the causes of stress and injuries changes to the routine, changes to the timings. The bodies are, I've been reading a lot just recently, bodies are, um, tend towards homeostasis. So anytime they get into a rhythm, they want to stay in that rhythm and they'll do everything to get back there. So if you give them any sort of shock, even if you think it's doesn't, it's not really, it's not, shouldn't be a shock, then it, it still is. So. I'm always paying attention to that stuff. All right. What about between um, ball sessions, like say on the same day, if you're doing two sessions a day? What's a, uh, oh, I, right now I'm at about five hours between, or oh, sorry, right now, right now I'm not doing anything. Um, in my last, my last uh, club was five hours between, um, which is probably, which is not too bad. Um, I've had four hours between in different, different clubs, um, which is probably the minimum, but if you can do five or six, it's probably, uh, um, probably make everybody, everybody the happiest. Um, we're already, we're, we've already been going for a while, but one thing <laughs> that I've experimented with um, also with Luke was having single sessions a day. So exactly having weights and yeah, having weights and uh, court sessions combined. Um, and the, the basic idea there is you don't, is you don't do a full weight session, a full in inverted commas weight session, but you do, smaller weight sessions every day attached to the or around the, the training time. Um, I actually really like that. I'd like to do more of it. Um, I haven't been able to because of the logistical, some logistical sort of conditions that I had, but I really like that because it's uh, um, doing weights every day, I think is, is good. Uh, it's one less warm up every day. It's, it's two less car trips, two less drives for players every day. Um, there's, I think there's a lot of benefits to that. Players need to be sold on it. So I've, I've had guys who were really into it and guys who hated it. Um, the ones who hated it, I, I, I'm, I, I think more likely they just weren't, we just didn't do a good job of explaining uh, why and why it would or should or could be good. Um, so that's the um, that's the thing about sessions. Luke maybe has had a little bit more experience with that recently. Um, I was thinking about the the same thing Mark was talking about with the, okay. the singles, but um, 
we uh, like this season we were I think we had a similar schedule to Mark in that we lift about nine thirty in the morning. Guys would lift, some would have court, and then practice was around four thirty in the evening. Um, and then the only time uh, that we ever ex- we have also experimented with lifting after a game in the in the in the season. Um, this is another topic. Um, but then, like like Mark was saying, it with the with the single sessions again, it in, it increases the amount of time you have to recover. Because if you th- if you look at two sessions a day, you know you're having your your session, then you've got your five hours, you got your session, then you got your longer your longer break. But it's you know it's still pretty repetitive. Whereas, but rather than when you have your one session, you have your one, and then you have you know a big a big period to to recover. So, you know it again it comes down to the way you you plan and and the way you structure the the practice with the weights. Um, but if you can do it uh, effectively, we, we found that it was really good. All right, and you're putting these weight sessions after training, not before. We well, there was there was uh, the year we did it. I, the players had three options. The three options were they could do everything before, and then have full practice. They could do everything after a full practice, or which we found after they started to work into it was that the best way to work it was that the guys were doing their legs before. So maybe they had two exercises of legs before the session. So they do a warm up, which was usually a structured, like I had written out a prevention warm up. They would do the warm up. So you're getting your prevention in. They would go and do their two exercises for their legs, practice, and then come back and they'd have two to three upper body exercises. So, um, it, it, we found that was the best way that the guys felt that they were good for practice. They were warm. So as soon as Mark got them out of the, like as soon as they stepped out of the gym from me with Mark onto the court, they were ready for balls and they were ready to get straight into it because everything is warm, activated. It didn't take 45 minutes to, to be able to get into to what you wanted. Sure. Um, was it Modena that was, that was, they were, they were doing lifting as part of their warm up, like activation. For, on game day, on match day, there are players. Uh, there are. Don't go for it, Mark. There are a lot of, a lot of teams. A lot of, uh, maybe not teams, but definitely individuals that do some weights on the morning of the game. Mm-hmm. So in my last, in my last team, there were three guys I think who would or who always did some lift in the morning, of a game. Okay. And you actually commented and, at one point, Mark, that you, you had your players, if there was a situation where you had to skip either weights or ball training on a day, that the players much preferred doing the weights and skipping the ball than the other way around. Is that, am I recalling that correctly? Um, so you're telling me that players preferred to practice less? That's no, 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 no. <laughs> they want to lift instead of play volleyball? Lift, lift <laughs> If they if they were forced into choosing because of constraints um, on that given day, I don't remember. I don't remember the context of the conversation, but there are, uh, and this is maybe from from my perspective, and I don't want to speak for Luke, but from my perspective, it's the uh, an overarching theme of the of the the preseason. The season is is to be healthy and ready to play and the um and the physical physical physically being physically strong and being not injured are really key components to being able to play and my my philosophy or my thinking is that coaches way overestimate the value of practice and that the and particularly the value of a single practice um whereas i don't think one practice makes any difference at all to the the technical level of a team especially during the season one weight training can make a really big difference because the especially depending on how what your scheduling has been uh weight training is the thing that 
that coaches typically don't want to do because they need to do four more minutes of setting high balls or something like that. Um, and so if there are some moments during the season when um, for whatever reason I can only do one, then definitely there are times that I will do weight training instead of ball training. We had a question on if you're combining weights and ball training in one session, how long is that generally going to run? Now that's a long session. Yeah, that one was. That one is always longer, because um, it like, you know, if. But it also, you got to think like, if if I'm if I'm not if the guys do the weights in the morning, or the guys didn't have anything in the morning and they show up, then I'm running warm up. Okay, maybe I'm doing twenty minutes. They're getting their personal time. We're doing some activation. Okay, then we're going to start getting into some like you know light ball stuff because we have to prepare them prime them for jumping. Okay, now we're at 40 minutes. All right, now we can we can get into it. You know, whereas if the guys are coming in, working at, you know, the same thing, they're, they're doing their, they're in 15 minutes to, to get through maybe their, their, you know, their prevention warm-up. Maybe it'll take a little bit longer if they want to take some time to roll and stuff like this. Um, but, you know, if they come in and they're doing 10, 15 minutes to do their two to three exercises and then they're back on the court, um, you know, you're essentially still, maybe you're even ahead of the game a little bit in that regard. And then when they go into the gym after, it's only going to take them 10, 10 15 minutes again. So, um, you know, you're pretty much splitting up a 30-minute session on either side of your practice. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured. You could go to, I mean, it's... Three and a half hours, easy. Four hours, even. Mm -hmm. uh, but remembering, mm -hmm. it's one time per day and only one warm up. Right, and so that actually the there's, there's a yeah, there's a second part of this question about whether or not you would do a morning session when you're doing the combined evening session. But I think the answer to that is what you just said was basically no. No, it just defeats, just defeats the purpose. The only morning session you'll get is on a serve and pass for a game day. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Santiago wants to know your opinion on using sand training during preseason uh, in terms of conditioning and maximizing the or minimizing the impact of ground, you know, impact, uh, and also, you know, some additional training. Right. I think I think being in the sand is great. Uh, it's obviously you know less taxing on your joints, and you know, like Mark was talking about, factoring in starting to jump, you can also you know, start to use that as maybe that's your introduction into getting into bigger jumps because, you know, the landing is a little bit softer. Uh, so, you know, you're conditioning the muscles more. Obviously, you're out in the sun, the elements, so this can be a little bit harder. Um, and you can also, like, you know, beach volleyball, if you're doing it once once a week or, you know, you're doing it on your Fridays before maybe you go on your weekend, you can always include, like, you know, you can have the guys doing a fitness component with the beach, you know, depending on who you've got. So I think, you know, being in sand and doing sand training is great. I think it's it's harder than working on dry land. So I think that if you want to take uh, your conditioning side of things, you can take it to the next level by for sure, you know, doing doing conditioning with the sand. And, and vice versa, you can also do it conditioning in the water as well. Okay. Good. I... I like to uh, I like to work on yep. sand. I do want I do it in that first four weeks. Surprise you tonight, um, and but I never do any act any practice in the sand. So if uh, whatever's in the it's it'll be a tournament. It'll be a two hour session where they they don't stop playing for two hours. But I'll never do anything technical in the sand. Kind of thought you would say that. Lack of specificity issues. Uh, okay. Uh, so we got a, a question that Rodrigo sent in earlier. I wanted to know about energy, energy system development uh, with regards to improving conditioning. I think the best way to train for volleyball is playing volleyball. So I think the best that, way to train for volleyball is playing volleyball. That, that, that's right. 
So I think the conditioning has to come. Uh, like you can do, you can do small like uh, interval training with uh, the weights or body weight, like a Tabata, or you can do small sprint stuff. But I think the best way to condition for volleyball is is the way that you structure the uh, the training session. And I think that this is the, the best way to improve the energy systems for for playing a sport. And so yes, you can do small things for uh, for conditioning and. And, and getting them to, to help leading into it. Uh, but I think that the, the best is, is, is really the coach and through the help of the strength coach maybe is, is structuring the, the practice to get the most out of them. Okay. All right. Now let's yes. get into that second four weeks, Mark. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> uh, I'd like to just quickly, the, the, the one about uh, chronic patella inflammation. Um, it's a that's a really that's not a really simple one, but the the basic idea is to uh, is to keep them practicing as much as possible um, to to change the sorry to keep them practicing as much as possible. Don't be afraid to give them days off. That's just a general theme. A day off can be really helpful. Um, how you approach it in the weights room is finding exercises, and this comes back to what I said about uh, Luke before, is, uh, is there are exercises, there are weight training exercises you can do that do not cause pain. Um, you might have to, it's difficult, you might have to, to experiment a while to find them. But you need to find those exercises that don't cause pain. Um, treat them, give them days off if you need them. You don't have to practice today. You, that's, you don't ever have to practice today. That's the, those are the, that's the, um, the advice that I would give to that question. Okay. Yeah, and with, with patellas, like you, if you are taking a day off, I think that um, if you can find exercises, it's also good that the, the tendons, tendons feed off load. So like an isometric or, you know, feeding off heavy loads, like a tendon can, can, and can really feed off this stuff. So even if they're not, if they, if it's a day they're not practicing and they're not doing the repetitive jumps, that doing something to help that tendon is going to be beneficial moving forward. So sometimes like the, the biggest thing is coming off a, a, a big vacation, like we were talking about four, and going straight back into the the um, the, the jumping and, and, and high level and high amounts of jumping because because tens, tendons are really sensitive. So if you have this really big spike in um, in load in, in in what you're doing, then you're going to have a lot of problems. So if you are taking days off to minimise the jumps, still having that load for the tendon um, to, to feed off is, is, is really important. And there's also a lot of uh, studies now that are coming out um, with the best kind of nutrition and the ways to get the nutrients you need to that tendon. So it's a lot about vitamin C and, and, and those kind of things. Okay, very good. All right. Back to the, the second four weeks. Second week. Second week of preseason month. <laughs> it never happens. It never happens. I only play in the first four weeks. After that, you just wing it. <laughs> You'd be surprised how how little I'm joking. Okay. I yeah. Um, but it, it actually goes back to, and I'll, I'll say this, I'll, I'll say this one again. It goes back to the, something I, I said a different time is that if you start reasonably slowly, you can always pick up, but if you go hard at the beginning and you, you push them past the limit in the beginning, you can never get them back. They'll be, they'll be tired and fatigued for the whole season. So it's better to go slowly for two or three weeks and then pick it up and maybe not be in perfect condition until the last week of the preseason or even the second game, God forbid. But you know, if you if you break them in the beginning, they're broken for the season. 
Right. And you may also not know, like you may have the over them, you may have overloaded them, and then you think they're looking like they're good, but then they hit a wall in you know towards the end of the week after. So, you know yeah. the, the yeah. progressive overload can can come back and, and bite in the ass, even if you think they are. Oh, I'll keep pushing them every day. You know the uh, over time, it's gonna it's gonna come back. All right. So the 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 focus of the question about the second four weeks is you you specifically mentioned that the first four weeks is weight training is the priority. So that pres yes. presumes when you shift into the second four weeks, weight training is no longer the priority. So how, how is the balance shifted? Uh, weight training is always important, which I, I hope has come across in a few different answers. Um, but in the second part of the, uh, in the second part of the preseason, I in the first part, if you remember, I told the physical coach to do what he wants, and I'll manage my work around that. Um, after that, then it becomes a little bit more. Um, I need to get this kind of technical work done. So, uh, if you can, whatever, if you can reduce the squats today, or or, or whatever, it hardly ever happens, but. Um, the uh, after the after that first period, then the technical becomes more of a uh, more of a focus. And I'm guessing that basically carries through the rest of the season. That basically carries through to the rest of the season. Okay. But as I said, once we get, you know, at some point in the season when we, um, you know, there are times when it's more important to do weights than than to to set four more balls. Sure. Uh, so uh, now that we're basically talking about <clears throat> beyond preseason, uh, Rodrigo had a question about, uh, the, the, I guess, the progression through the week in terms of the training Monday through Friday. Uh, he wants to know about going from FMAX to power and how do you manage goal sessions and strength and conditioning? Uh, so the way that I try and... The way that I try and handle in regards to the way that the, the, the effort levels the guys are going to put in, the effort and the weights and the amount of load and these things is through the way that I plan their programs. So, so I can talk to the guys, but I know that certain exercises, they'll be able to go harder on than, than other exercises or the rep range or the amount of sets. So through the way that I plan their programs is the way that I, I don't know, I, I use this word, but I never use it for the plays, manipulate their program. The way that they will perform is through the way that I plan um, and the exercises. So, you know, if a guy wants, if a guy's squatting at the start of the week and, they, and they're working harder, I know that the, the you know, their, their DOMS is going to be bigger in that exercise then if a guy is working a little bit harder in cleans that you know because of that exercise that they're probably less likely to be as sore in two days time so the way that you structure it and the way that you kind of ramp up their week or go up and then you know taper off towards the end of the week um is is the way that i plan so you know if they're doing squats four times four at the start of the week but then maybe an exercise towards, so if they're playing on a Saturday and you're doing something on a Thursday, especially when we were doing uh, the one sessions, was I, a lot of time I just did two sets of 12 reps because it was hitting the, the muscle, you know, it, it was getting a little bit of muscle tension, but it also because you're only doing the two sets, is it means that the guy can't keep going up and up and up, or he can't keep going back and picking up different dumbbells each time. So, you know, he does, maybe he does a warm up set, maybe a guy doesn't, this is each individual. But if you structure it to just two sets, then you know that the increase of weight is only going to happen once. So, because a guy's not going to go pick up a 15 kilo dumbbell and then progress to a 30, this isn't going to happen, you know. Usually it's going to go 15, maybe 17 and a half, or 15 to 20. So, you know, again, it's the way that that I kind of monitor. Obviously, you can look at the guy's sheet and and, and see how he is. But the way that I monitor and um, work with the load is the way that I structure their is the way that I do their 
their programs. Okay. I hope that answered it. If not, please tell yeah. me. Yeah. Try to uh, okay. I think we've got a couple of related questions that have to do with uh, explosive training. Uh, I'm saying plyos. Um, are you incorporating plyos into your work? So some of the faster movement stuff, um, I can I can tell you. I can give you an example. Um, this year with the Olympic qualification uh, period, Mark and I had one week in in Yashembia, um, and my my philosophy going into that was that we needed to have a bigger emphasis on the court with Mark than we did in the way through because guys were coming in off already a heavy period. They're coming in off, you know, playing for four months. So the way that I structured it was that most of the stuff was just light, you know, really got the nervous system going, uh, some, you know, med ball slams, some med ball chest passes, some band work, um, you know, some cleans. And this more explosive stuff, so it would prime the nervous system they could go back, wasn't heavy, recover faster. And then when it came to the night session, guys were more at an optimal level to be able to, to practice. There was, not, there was not going to be showing up to practice fatigued and then affecting the volleyball. So this was one example. Um, and then also towards there, as we were starting to get into playoffs here, was we were starting to incorporate more lighter um, explosive stuff. In regards to plyometrics, um, I personally don't do that in season because they're already jumping enough in regards to spiking, blocking, serving. Um, and I think it's a little, it can get a little bit dangerous if you're pushing the plyometric stuff with guys that are already doing so much. So I think mm -hmm. if you're doing that, it needs to be in the summer when you don't have volleyball as your, as your, uh, your focus. Uh, in terms of when you have multiple matches in a week, for example, you know, you play on the weekend and you maybe have a Wednesday cup match or something like that. Mm -hmm. What are you doing um, with the, the strength training uh, and weeks structured that way? Uh, so I can, I can tell you what we did this season. and I'm sure Mark can tell you what he did because uh, we were playing every two games a week for the entire season. Uh, we were lifting Monday morning. So the guys had uh, in their program two, two sessions. Um, they would do their, you know, their day one program on a Monday. Tuesday uh, was just the one session with the, the practice. And they obviously had a Monday night practice. And play on the Wednesday. Uh, and then Thursday, a lot of time we would, we would practice with just weights and a little bit of court in the Thursday in the evening. Friday practice and then Saturday game. So we were doing still the two sessions. Uh, the only time you really had to keep an eye on what we were doing was on a Thursday evening, because if we were lifting on a Thursday evening and our game on Saturday was at two o'clock, obviously again, what we were talking about before, the, the amount of recovery time has been reduced because it's, you know, you're not playing eight o'clock at night game, it's two o'clock, which means everything's gonna be pulled forward. So on those times, I always made sure that the guys were aware it's a two o'clock game, reduce the amount of weight you're doing so that your recovery can, can be faster. Um, if it was an extended week, then we, all, we had uh, individual prevention stuff that the guys were, were, were able to do. Anything to add, Mark? Uh, the goal is always to have two weight sessions a week, come what may. Um, and then it depends on it depends on the structure of the week and the timing of the games. Um, so, and when you put in your free day. So my general rule is that I won't go more than 10 days in a row without a free day. So that's, that's when you get that time when maybe you do a weight session instead of a court session somewhere, somewhere in there. Okay. Luke, do you have a cycle? With with your your weight program, um, the way that I cycle is that I treat preseason completely different. So I don't have like a okay. I, I base it around the season. So preseason and the lead in uh, as its own little 
period. Um, then the first half of the season is the other period, second half, and then playoffs. So I break it into, into those sections. Um, and then inside of, like, first half of the season, second, every four, after every four weeks, especially this season, I've tried to have a deload week um, just so they can get the super composition coming back and, and feeling better for it. So, um, yeah, treating like preseason, everyone pretty much in the same boat, trying to learn everybody and also trying to hit, get everybody um, general in, in regards to the health wise and then start to, to get a bit more specific um, as it went. And then in playoffs, probably this season, if we had had playoffs, I would have gone a bit lighter and more dynamic and, and then inside of those exercises, change things for individuals. So I try to just look at how the season breaks up in regard to the cycle. Sure. Okay. Um, at this point, we don't have any other questions. Is there anything that you guys think we haven't hit on yet that we should? I, to, if I could summarize everything, I would say um, that I would make Luke's first point that the goal of the weight training program is for players to be healthy. Um, the co coordination, the, the teamwork between uh, coach, physical coach, physio are really important. The um, readiness, willingness to be flexible is really important. Um, and the mindset and this is probably more of the from the coach's perspective is that you can always miss a day and if you can miss one day and this is something that i say to the teams it's written in my handbooks it's better to miss one day today than to miss one week in a month's time and that's what it comes down to is that um, most injuries if you get them on day zero or day one, and you can sometimes get them on day minus five because, you know, little bits of um, muscle fatigue here or some little stretch in the knee there is not an injury yet, but you can get it really early and you can get through a season with the minimum number of injuries. So those are my, my takeaways. Or what I'd like to be the takeaway. Sorry. Uh, anything to add, Luke? Uh, yeah. I, like I said, you know, the biggest thing is is really monitoring your players by using your eyes and, and you know having a good relationship with the players. And if you can be in a situation where they really enjoy coming to the gym and working with you. And, and what you have to offer them, that you're going to get the most out of, out of the weights. Um, and if that, if that happens, then a lot of time it's going to translate to, to being healthy and, and playing better volleyball. So, you know, don't ever, don't ever discount, you know, the, the personal interactions and, and ability to help one individual or, or the whole team. Because if you, can, if you can connect with those few guys, then a lot of the problems they've had in the past and if you can find a way to help them or if you can actively go out of your way to, to find the answer um, or trial something with them, then, you know, you can, you can not only um, help them improve but raise their confidence and, and also, you know, build that friendship for a long time after. So uh, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of aspects in, in strength and conditioning. A lot of people do it differently. So, you know, sometimes there's no right or wrong answer, you know, but at the end of the day, you, you're working to, to help, help the athlete, help the coach, help the club, uh, and all try and get the, the same result. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we did have one question that doesn't really deal with weight training per se. Uh, this is more about the calendar. So, Mark, here's your chance to, to share your thoughts on the FIVB. CEV, whoever else you want to throw, whatever alphabetical groups you want to put in here uh, in terms of the, the 12 month calendar that's currently in place. The one 
one there's one part of this conversation that uh, that people is that tends to be overlooked. So uh, we're always talking about how much the players play. Actually, there are two parts. So how much the players play and they go from this competition, they go from that competition and so on. I think that the number, that the amount that players play is, is not unreasonable. If you consider the, uh, the number of games that uh, Bruno plays compared to the number of games that LeBron James plays, um, then I, I don't think that there's a, there's a, a significant difference there. And I would guess that that uh, Bruno plays a few games less. The the actual things that uh, are issues are the travel between between games. So the um, uh, so in VNL the or any international competition, there's a the travel component is I think is more significant than the number of games. And the second one that nobody will ever talk about is practice. So the, if there's one big difference between NBA players and international volleyball players is that uh, NBA pro players practice a lot less, especially while they're playing. Mm -hmm. And no, like I said, no coach wants to talk to this, and this is actually the first time I've said it out loud, but the if you cut down uh, national team training periods. I don't think that you would significantly decrease performance. On the contrary, I think you would find uh, performance maintaining a remarkably high level. And the players would have, would have that free time. And you don't need to practice. You could even, you, well, nobody wants to, but making seasons short is not reasonable, but... Um, but yeah, so I think the travel is a bigger component than the number of games, and so is the amount of training. Uh, particularly the training and the extended training they do when they're with national teams. Okay. Yeah, I think the tricky comparison with something like the NBA is, yes, they play. They absolutely play more more games in a season, and especially when you throw in playoffs, and they're playing mm -hmm. sometimes every day every other day, you know, probably in most cases, uh, there's definitely a mm -hmm. lot of travel for those guys. Uh, but you're right. They're yeah. probably practices probably are not all that frequent mornings. They do a lot of shoot around type things, but that's, that's not practice per se, the way most people would think of it. I imagine. Um, but the one thing you could say is most of those guys do not have any kind of international commitment. So their season ends in, say, June, for example. The next season doesn't start until October. So they've got a big block where they're basically off, you know, between seasons, which our guys don't have. Uh, so that, you know, I think maybe... The timing of competition... Go ahead. The timing of competition is different. It's not exactly comparable. Yes, I I agree. But the basic principle that the basic principle that we we practice too much, I think holds. Okay, won't argue with that. All right. And we'll especially when you consider when you consider that injury, most volleyball injuries are overload injuries, and volleyballers practice three times to every one match. So, I don't know. That seems like fairly significant mathematics to me. Blasphemy, Mark. Coaching blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. Thanks for all the questions. This was definitely, I believe, the most questions we've, we've had in one of these sessions, which is why it's also yeah. the longest session that we've had so far. Yay! <laughs> and in Part two, we'll talk about the last week of the preseason and the first month of the season. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward right. to that sequel. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for anybody who's interested, to tomorrow's session, uh, one, uh, David Gill from Vert, uh, from Vert is going to be involved, and he's going to be talking 
of performance metrics. Uh, obviously, I'm, uh, he's going to focus a lot on his devices and the, the information they get, which is more advanced now than, than what they used to get, which was mainly just jumps and how high. Um, so for those who really want to dig into numbers, which clearly is not Luke, <laughs> feel, you know, feel free to join us for that. Uh, beyond that, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for Mark and Luke for this, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, guys.